My name is Boris Moisten from Black Men Talk Tech. Uh, and uh, we are putting on a panel today on e-commerce and digital marketing. The reason this panel came up was because we were having a conversation with Jay Vaughn months ago, and he was telling us about the explosion in e-commerce because of the lockdown and how like people like our grandparents have finally been forced to figure out how to order things online. And uh, we're talking about whether or not this behavior is going to be a tectonic shift in a long-term trend going forward. And I think our, our answers were like, yeah, I'm probably still going to do a lot of online ordering, even when things are back to normal again, right? Um, and then that, that peaked the question, right? Because a lot of businesses were hurting, particularly small businesses, particularly Black businesses, when the lockdown happened. And you know, we were talking about the need for many of these businesses to switch to and use some technology, right? Tech enable their businesses and switch to e-commerce or digital marketing and figure out how to use technology to, you know, to sort of get ahead. Um, one quote I would give you is Popeye's chicken at the lowest part of the lockdown had sales go up 130%. Right. And everyone else was going out of business. So and they were investing in mobile delivery like years ago. That's all we say. That's all we're trying to say. Like, have our community uh, sort of focus on this. And um, I'm going to let uh, John Saunders take over uh, today. He is our moderator. Uh, John Saunders is the founder of 5-4 Digital Media Company, which we use um, out of Florida. Uh, he's also the founder of Black Illustration. So if you need Black characters for your website, go look him up on LinkedIn get his black illustration um, uh, illustrations and they're beautiful characters, put them on your website or in your presentation decks. Uh, Javon Frazier, man, I'm going to let John introduce him, but uh, he's a man of many talents, uh, loves the comic books, worked for Disney and, um, and uh, what's the name of that big company again? The one with the, the, one with the M? There you go. <laughs> big Marvel from Marvel. So we can stay here and talk the Falcon and, um, and uh, the Winter Soldier all day. I thought, uh, I thought that was, that, that's what this panel is about, right? <laughs> well, we're, we're going to do it. We may have a clubhouse. We may have a clubhouse for it. And then Orion Brown. I went to school with this sister. Love her to death. She's extraordinarily just brilliant. Uh, expert in marketing. Uh, is the founder of the Black Travel Box. And did I say Javon was the founder of Maestro Media? That uh, he is, but I'm going to be quiet there, and I'm going to let uh, John Saunders take over, and I'm going to tend to this waiting room. Boris, Boris, I appreciate you, man. Thank you all for coming through, and thank you, Javon, Orion, for for sliding through. And we, man, we were talking for like ten or fifteen minutes before this, just about comics, and and uh, it, this is going to be exciting because it's a nice private uh, group. We're going to drop some e-commerce bombs. I'm going to ask some serious questions, so make sure y'all are taking notes. Make sure you got your iPad, your, you know, your, your, your Apple pencil, whatever you've got, even notepad, you know, works too. So I'm on first and foremost, I'm going to introduce these two because I want y'all to get the full scope of what we're about to jump into. Um, we got two amazing guests. So if you've been looking to launch or scale your e-commerce store, you know, build your brand, go direct to the consumer or just improve your digital prowess. We're dropping serious bars today. So I'm going to get the, into it and we're going to drop these actionable tips. So first and foremost, I got to introduce Orion. She is revolutionizing travel. As a Chicago native, Orion is an entrepreneur and brand management consultant with over 15 years experience dynamically leading cross-functional teams across multiple industries within both large and small cap businesses. So let that soak in a little bit, y'all. She has deep expertise in consumer insight-driven brand strategy, crucial piece of, uh, of, of brand building, as well as product and packaging innovation and portfolio management. But Orion's talents don't stop there. She's highly effective in recruiting, coaching, and mentoring, and started the Black Travel Box, registered trademark, by the way, so make sure y'all know, <laughs> to give women of color a brand they could trust for their travel care needs. And I saw the branding, I saw the packaging, it's on point, Orion, so kudos I love the design and elements that you've leveraged. And so as Black travelers, we have few places we can get products that work for our hair and skin. Well, I don't have hair, but you know, us as a whole and skincare needs. And Orion fulfilled that need with amazing products and travel sizes. Honestly, I think it's genius. And um, I love the aesthetic of the brand as well. But hold up, hold up. We got, we got a little bit more, y'all. Um, I do want to talk about 
Javon. Now, me as an avid gamer, I remember blowing my Nintendo cartridges back in the day. I still got my Nintendo, still got my SNES. So if y'all want to smoke on Street Fighter, please let me know. But um, ready, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, J- <laughs> so Javon uh, worked as a VP at Marvel in the games marketing. Yes, that Marvel, of course. While designing, implementing, and facilitating marketing programs that led to the sales success of all Marvel Interactive releases across all digital platforms worldwide, overseeing 40 game titles generating over 600 million in gross revenue. So since then, he's become the chief product officer and president of gaming at Studio 71, working with dope games like Marvel Puzzle Quest, Marvel vs. Capcom, and Marvel vs. Um, War of Heroes. So currently, Javon is the founder of Maestro, Maestro Media, my apologies, helping clients deepen their consumers' brand engagement and create new revenue streams by launching fun and innovative consumer products. So without further ado, thank you, Javon. Thank you, Orion, for coming through. I appreciate y'all. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm just happy to be here to, to, to moderate this panel. That was awesome. Are we done? That, that was that, that's it, right? <laughs> yeah, we done. We're some wrap. Fuck on up. You're good. You're good. You're good. <laughs> Let me bust out the whiskey right quick. Yeah, that was great. <laughs> Were you just supposed to get whiskey? Four is pathetic. <laughs> no, but no, but seriously though, thank you both for, for coming through. Um, you know, I want this to be an open forum, so I'll ask questions. Um, feel free to elaborate, feel free to, to deviate from the question. You know, we want to keep this really fun and engaging. It's Friday night. You know, and everybody took time out of their day before the weekend to do that. So, Orion, I'll start with you. Um, my first question is, you know, what made you choose your niche and what was your strategy for reaching your ideal consumer? Oh, um, yeah. So when I created Black Travel, Black Travel. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. oh, got some feedback. Damn, that's- oh. got to- <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Hello, hello. All right, we good. Um, so when I created Black Travel Box, I really created it out of to be honest, my own boredom, right? So I had been working at Oracle doing a lot of like, you know, analytics and data driven stuff in the data cloud space and really missed having my hands on a physical product. Um, And so that frustration paired with my frustration of being an avid traveler, being black, having this fluffy bun that shouldn't even be that big. It just gets bigger by the humidity and traveling with it and being like, you know what? I can't believe that there's nothing out here that just recognizes black people are not always at home or they're not always in the hood in a metro area and so going to places like japan i don't even know how to explain to them what it is that i'm looking for if i need to find packaged products to get myself through a 10-day trip and so the niche was really the need i would equate it to the need so it's finding the need and it just happened to be a need that i was passionate about because i had a day job and so With that, I had to back into then, okay, if I'm the consumer, I'm not every consumer, but I am a core, this gives me a hypothesis to start with. Now, let me go off of the things that I understand about myself, about my lifestyle, things like that, and let me go test that. And I just started to test that with other people I knew in the space. And then it's like, well, obviously I know other people, so we're gonna have things in common. So let me start talking to people further out and see what resonates with them. And as I kind of took these concentric circles of, everything from cornering my poor friends at dinner parties. Like, so I know you just about to go out of town. So what's in your bag? What do you have packed? All the way to doing surveys and doing more scaled, um, you know, essentially research. That's how we got to who that consumer is, the psychographic as well as the demographic. I love that. Thank you. And I loved what you said. The niche was the need. The niche was the need sounds a little bit better, of course, but no, I love that. I love that. And then you, so you spoke to people, you saw it resonates, and then you did larger scale um, questionnaires and really talked to your, your potential client um, to make sure that you were resonating. Cause it's like you said, a lot of folks say, Oh, I love this product and I'm going to use this product, but you don't really know what the consensus is. So you went out and you got that information to be able to make those informed decisions. That's super dope. I appreciate that. I appreciate that. And um, my, my next question is, is for you, Javon. Uh, how did you get your start in the gaming industry and how can others break into the business? Uh, I think my start is the same way as your start. Uh, I used to live in Gardena and I used to walk down uh, the street and go put quarters in that Street Fighter machine. So you you throwing out the gauntlet, dude. I, I, nobody, I kind of cheat because I use Chun-Li. But, I, but, but, but nobody, um, I think nobody can get me on those sticks. And so uh, I, I just always had a love for video games uh, from, you know, I think just based upon 
my age and and the time when you know I was a kid. I was there. You know, the, the NES came out like right, right at the right time when I was right at the right age, and that like changed my life. So I was like you said, I was blowing those those cartridges. You can't put them all the way in. You have to like blow on it, put it like you know, uh, you know, eight tenths the way in, hit it down to make it work. And so that's that's my childhood, and I never I never lost that love uh, for video games, and so. Um, carried on to my time at Marvel, uh, where I got a chance to work on um, the Thor video game for the first Thor movie, uh, the Captain America video game for the first Captain America movie. And that was kind of my really entry into being in the video game business, um, actually putting out video games and, and marketing video games. And so um, that that really was that transition and kind of my, my whole career has been, I've uh, been blessed to kind of have some sort of thing, whether it was comic books or something that I loved as a kid, that turned into a career. And, and video games is another one of those things where, you know, I just remember kind of getting those, if, if I if I got good grades, I get a new NES game. And, and that transitioned to, you know, me uh, being a video game executive and, and that's still that passion, uh, you know, uh, you know, just continues to this day. That's amazing, that's great. And, um, you know, it makes me think about when we were all kids, you know, our parents would be like, oh, go outside. You know, you're not going to make any money playing those video games. Oh, work? I'm not. I mean, now you have, you know, Javon, you were able to get your, into your career at that level. And now you have kids that are into esports and it's become an industry that's really competitive. And, and they say a billion dollar, but it's probably going to be a trillion dollar industry soon. I told my mom she lost a lot of money. She should have nurtured me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, six, I'm six foot four, but I'm, I'm highly uncoordinated, right? So they wanted me to play basketball. <laughs> my entire life and i'm like you know and they're like I, they want me to play some sort of sport they want to play basketball and all that I, I sucked right and it's like well look i was really good at that thing mom if you yeah. just supported me thumbs count. <laughs> I'd, be thumbs done. Count. I'd be ninja right right know, thumbs count <laughs> <laughs> so so tell me um orion i know you i know you're working on a few things and you have and you have some projects as well but what's a typical day for you like as an entrepreneur and and what are some of the hacks that you use to leverage to get through it. Cause I, you know, I say, I ask that because I know that we probably have entrepreneurs in here or we have people working full-time jobs and them wanting to launch their own e-commerce store and do some type of business. What are some of the, the hacks you leverage to stay focused? Cause I know as soon as you get done with this, you jump in on a flight and I know you're a jet setter. So I'd love to hear from you on that. I mean, not with the Rona out here, but I am, <laughs> I'm hopping around a little bit for family stuff, but uh, you know what? My days aren't particularly typical. I think the biggest well, one, I think a big hack for me, hack, is debunking the BS that there's always like this list of five things, 10 things that highly effective people do before 4 a.m. I'm sleeping before 4 a.m. because I need to be highly effective when I'm communicating with people and I need to be highly effective when I'm thinking about my business. And if I'm tired, baby, it's going sideways. It's going sideways. And so the first hack is actually taking care of myself, taking care of my body. Yeah, you know, there's moments where we gotta get that Popeye's chicken cause it's on the blow up, it's on the come up right now. We gotta, you know, dial it and get that delivery. But just making sure that I actually am thinking about my own health, my own well being. If I have a headache, I stop. I take care of the headache. I'm like, it's Advil right there. Why is it 10 feet away and I can't walk and go get it? So just making sure that I take that time to be really aware of myself and what I need physically, especially being inside all day, right? You know, it's just a very different thing when you're not getting fresh air, when you're not interacting with a ton of people all, at, you know, in a, in a regular day. Secondarily to that is mental health, right? And so therapy people do it, even if you don't feel like there's a problem, because you at least have a space to explore the things that have frustrated you, have a space to, um, to talk about and, and really say what you want to say. Because if you, if you like me, I don't always say what I won't say. You can say it to your therapist, presuming they actually understand what you're talking about. Uh, so we can't do like Falcon and Winter Soldier with her, but that's all right. I got y'all for that. Uh, <laughs> yes, Boris, you do have a problem. Um, and then I think the third thing really is um, find places that you can take your expertise out of the equation because there's plenty of them, right? I'm not great at being an entrepreneur. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not great at it. I'm great at collecting a check, baby. You wanna send me a check every two weeks or every month? I am here for it. I will take all the extra frivolous insurance, the legal insurance, the dental, the vision, all of that. Um, but when you think about what you have to do as an entrepreneur, particularly in the e-commerce space, there is a lot of, frankly, administrative stuff that you do need to get, you know, 
dangerous in how much you know about it, but you do not need to be spending your time with it because your expertise and your, your zone of genius has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the core of the business, your why, what you're selling, whether it be a product or a service and understanding your, your consumer and your customer. So if you, if you can spend your time doing those three things and farm out as much as you can of the rest of it, let go of the control, understand that you can fire people five seconds after you hire them because you are the boss, then you'll be in a really good place to get started. Wow. Wow. So I, I, first I got to reiterate and unpack some of that because you dropped some bars there. So one is take care of self, make sure you're getting sleep, make sure you're getting rest. Cause that's a big thing with entrepreneurs. You know, there's this thing where you have to hustle until you're dead. Right. And it's to the point where if you hustle to that point and you're not healthy, your business can't function either way. Right. And you need to get to a point where you can take yourself out of the business. And so sleep and mental health is important as well. Making sure you're getting therapy. That's one thing that I thought about that I haven't done yet. Um, and there's so many opportunities now, especially with, with um, being able to work with virtual therapists and things like that. The opportunity is super open. And then the third piece you said is essentially delegate, right? Focus on your efforts of where you specialize and then delegate out the things you can so you can focus on, on where, you, uh, where, you, where you excel. So, Orion, that was, that was super dope. Thank you for that. And, um, you know, Jamon, in the same question, what's a typical day for you like? I see you're, you're in your daughter's um, homeschool setup right now. So I know it's, uh, you, I know you're, uh, you, you've got a busy lifestyle going on. So tell me a little bit about what a typical day looks for, uh, looks like. Oh, to you. I can't take any credit. My wife, my wife is homeschooling our two daughters. So, uh, this is all theatrics. I'm, I'm, I'm never in this <laughs> area. I had to, I had to borrow her laptop. So that's why this is, this is, you know, cause I'm on my laptop all the time and it died. And cause I, I guess, it's hard, hard question for me because I'm, I'm kind of an unbalanced entrepreneur other than the fact that my next Kickstarter I know launches in 31 days, 13 hours, 37 minutes, and 38 seconds, right? I'm always kind of that classical entrepreneur when I'm, I'm go, 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 go. Um, I think for me, a, a, a typical day is, uh, you know, protecting the clients and protecting the customers, right? That's what I, I, I focus on every single day. And my clients are the people that I'm launching products or, or products with and the customers of people that are buying our products. And so all day, every day, I'm thinking about um, the clients and the customers. I think I think where I find balance is I'm blessed to have two amazing, beautiful daughters that I think are probably watching this right now. Um, and my, my, uh, my, my oldest daughter is getting into music. And so we have a music class and we do that together. And my, my youngest daughter, that is the one homeschooling class I, I guess I, I do teach. <laughs> and then uh, my, my youngest daughter, we, like this week we had like a dance party, right? She was like, she was like, all right, dad, enough work. She came in, so we played like, you know, freeze dance. And so and I think get breaking up some of the time with family, right? I think one of the, the challenges, one of the blessings about this whole thing is, you know, I used to fly 125,000 miles a year, um, just being, you know, traveling to China and, and building different products. And so now I'm flown zero. And so I think one of the things I've been able to do is, is, is get more balance with the family. And that's been something that's been a blessing during this pandemic and, and something I'm trying to get better at, <laughs> you know, um, because, because I do have a lot of those entrepreneurial tendencies of, of, of doing too much, being up at four and doing all that. And I think if, if I can, you know, I, I'm working to, 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 to balance a little bit better. And hopefully that's something that sticks with me, even as, you know, the world quote unquote opens up. Wow. Both great answers, y'all. And, and one one common denominator, and I appreciate y'all being so transparent because a lot of entrepreneurs are like, well, you know, every day I wake up at 4.30 and I have my green tea and then I do a two hour workout followed by an hour and a half of meditation. You know what I mean? I, I feel like you, you gave us a realistic portrayal of, hey, this is what goes on in the life of an entrepreneur. So I appreciate that. And that, that leads into my next question in regards to e-commerce. You know, myself, I've been in the e-commerce space as well. I'm a huge proponent of Shopify and, and building out e-commerce platforms and leveraging these online tools. And so for folks that are getting started, maybe they just launched their store on, say, Shopify or they're using WooCommerce for WordPress. What are some of your favorite e-commerce tools that you'd recommend for managing an online business? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, obviously, if, 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 you, if you don't, uh, you know, have, have, a, have a Shopify you should, <laughs> right? Uh, there, there's kind of the 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 overall, uh, you know, uh, e-commerce landscape. Uh, you know, I, I like to say this, and it's probably the word this for this panel 
came from, you know, we, we've literally uh, moved forward 10 years in the last year. I mean, I, you know, so far as the, tech, the technology and the people uh, really focusing on, uh, you know, uh, e-commerce as like, you know, if you look at any sort of life cycle thing, which is what Boris said to start this off, it's like, you know, you, you've got the early adopters, the, you know, the middle, and then you've got the laggards. And so my grandma ordering Postmates is an indication that frankly, you know, e-commerce <laughs> has, has really, you know, it, it's, it really is a thing. And so, and so frankly, I think, I think, you know, obviously, uh, uh, you know, having CRM software, we're, we're really, really uh, big into kind of, uh, you know, owning our customers, owning our customer um uh, data and and really you know focused on as an e-commerce brand because i said you know the two things are my clients and my customers on the customer side we, we've got you know um a lot of tools that we're we're utilizing to continue that two-way communication uh via our shopify and so we're, we're really focused on that um I'm, I'm i'm like blanking on the name of the actual email software that we use <laughs> but uh but but frankly like um but um, we, we, you know, that, that's kind of a big thing. And, and obviously uh, we've, uh, my big thing is Kickstarter, right? And so from a Kickstarter perspective, that's one of the biggest platforms with regards to, um, community for e-commerce I've ever seen. We've been able to self-fund our business via Kickstarter. Um, we've, I've done over $8.1 million, um, in Kickstarter since 2016. And that's been the way that we've been able to self-fund big product businesses for clients via, you know, developing campaigns via the Kickstarter platform. And so, you know, I, th I think that's a that's going to be, uh, you know, going forward, uh, how you utilize e-commerce, how do you build an audience on e-commerce is key in, in order to, you know, build build your own your own brands. Like you, it, the, the barrier to entry for you to launch a product it's, you know, you, anyone can build a Shopify. You said like anyone can get a Kickstarter. And so, you know, I think it's, it's even more important that people take a shot. And I think that's one of the reasons I'm, I'm here today is to kind of encourage folks to go out there and take their shot. A lot of people have products and ideas and it's never been more easier in the history of time to go out and build your own store, you know, crowdfund it yourself, build your own email list in order to really launch your brand and launch your businesses. Hey, could I ask you a quick question around that? Well, what type of products would be best for a Kickstarter or for you know a, a, any one of the other platforms to do a big, a big non-equity raise on? I guess a platform where you're actually selling the product for funding instead of you know selling equity. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, that that's a great question. The we've been able, you know, as an entrepreneur, you know, a lot of entrepreneurs kind of go out they get a product and then they are trying to fundraise uh against their product when, when i say fundraiser they're out they're all trying to get uh you know get funds from vcs and, and things like that we've, we've been able to self fund our business we have a big kickstarter that's coming out uh less than a month from now uh, and that's in the game space and so we, we've been focused in in games uh board games specifically because of the ltv of board games and the fact that we've been able to kind of uh build that community but we've, I've seen a variety of different things. Uh, video games have done well. I've seen uh, standard consumer products. I've seen, you know, uh, healthcare products do good. And so, you know, it, it really, it's less about the type of product and more so about you being able to tap into a niche and an audience to, to be able to build that product out. And so like, you know, with us, the reason we've done so well in board games is because as you, as this whole kind of narrative, I've, I'm a gamer <laughs> and I love games. And I, you know, I, I'm, I can talk to you about Street Fighter. I can talk to you about Marvel. I can talk to you about comic books. So I'm in that world and I love, I love it. And so when I'm, when I'm marketing to fans, it's very authentic because I am staying up to midnight watching Falcon and the Winter Soldier. And I am, <laughs> you know, <laughs> reading comic books and all that. So when I'm talking about the games, these, these are games and products that I, I love. So I think, I think it's less so about like a founder saying, Hey, you know, what is the type of product I want to get into to get a check and more so about what are you passionate about? What do you love? And what can, cause that, cause in this space, the one thing it is, I, I did a lot of work with, with influencers. I used to be the chief product officer 
for a company called Studio 71, you know, they had uh, uh, 10 billion views a month across 1300 in, uh, influencers or digital creators, which I, I think I, I like to say better than the term influencer. You, Boris, you and I have gotten into that before. But the one, the one thing that's so authentic with, you know, winning digital creators versus not winning digital creators is, is, a, is a sense of authenticity uh, with regards to, you know, when they're, when they're putting out a product, when they're putting out their content. And I think that's so key. And so I think if, if you're if you're looking at a product, what are the products that you buy, and what are the things that you love, and and because it, it to be an entrepreneur, you're putting all your passion into it. So if you, if it's something that you don't like, you, you're not going to be successful, right? It, it it's you know the for, for all intents and purposes, you know, like I said, I'm I'm an I'm working you know all day and all night, and so I I, I have to love the things that I'm putting out there uh, and, and my fans will pick up on it if it's not authentic. So, uh, you know, I think it's more so what are you passionate about because you're going to have to convey that passion to your audience. No, no, definitely, definitely. And, and so, you know, to kind of go back to the tools that, that you mentioned, and I want to break into the black travel also, because uh, Orion, you leveraging some really great tools. I know you're using Shopify. I see you got Hotjar, Google analytics, Klaviyo. So I want you to kind of give us your tech stack, that you're leveraging everybody if you if you haven't checked it out yet the black travel box.com is orion's brand and um i'd love to hear the tools that you use and the ones that you recommend to anyone starting out in e-commerce as well yeah definitely i think it goes back to the adage that you can't like you can't improve the things that you can't measure so any tool that you use and there's tons of tools out there my first thing is can i actually measure what this is doing the benefit of it can I actually see what's happening with my consumer, et cetera? So, um, you know, I start out with Shopify. Shopify is great. It has its own analytics stack within it. So if you're just starting out, you at least have a great starting point where you can look at, you know, customer behavior on site, um, you know, abandoned carts, things like that. The things that are actually going to draw in dollars at the end of the day, like the actionable things, not the pretty bells and whistles, not, oh, let me get this button to bounce around and move and, and wiggle in your face but the stuff that really tells you what's happening with your store space. So if you think about it like a physical retail space in your mind and it's like Shopify is your merchandising, right? And so how you create sort of that window dressing, how you interact with people in the store, all of those things are coming together on the Shopify platform. Beyond that, and Shopify has great things like you can do Shopify chat and all these other little widgets and things that you can do. They, they're gonna nickel and dime you on it, but it's worth it. Um, the Shopify apps are actually the free ones. Everybody else's, they, they're going to get you. But if I had to start a store tomorrow, just, you know, selling Ma's favorite cookies or whatever it is, I would start out with Shopify, Clavio, and maybe, well, I'll say Google Analytics, although it really isn't a tech stack. Um, it's kind of a given. But, you know, if you're going to have, uh, and I presume people are, are familiar with pixels and whatnot, if you're going to be tracking what's going on with your site. If you have a physical good that people search for, then you definitely want to have Google Analytics. If you have a physical good that, or, or anything that people aren't necessarily searching for, then you definitely want to have a Facebook pixel. But this will enable you to understand who's showing up, how are they showing up, and how can you talk them later. And so with Clavio, now you have an integration. It basically works as a CRM stack for you. So um, if, if you're not completely familiar, people go, oh, well, MailChimp's fine. MailChimp is fine if you're just, just starting and you're not trying to do anything with it, but you may, just, may as well pay a little bit more, um, start with your tiny little you know, email list of your friends and family and start analyzing the hell out of it because there's just so much that you can do in terms of segmentation. Um, you know, John, you asked me earlier about how did I choose my consumer? I get a lot of great data and refine my consumer based off of what I see in Clavio and how they're behaving and interacting with emails, how they're behaving and interacting um, with commentary, how they are, whether or not they're purchasing, whether they're opening, that kind of stuff. And so that stack right there is a great place to start because you can automate so much. And it goes back to my point of uh, not necessarily delegation, but automation, right? Finding places where your, your uh, expertise is not required. You can literally go on Clavio just having set it up, just paying, just having paid for it and have an abandoned cart sequence already set up in there in like five minutes, right? It's not going to be perfect or pretty and have all the bells and whistles, but if you want something that's going to be like, hey, you, did you, for, 
y'all forget something? Because you got some stuff in your cart right here. That turns dollars. Those open rates are crazy. And so making sure that you have those core pieces is just really, that's what I look for, that, that analytics aspect. Ooh. Oh my gosh. Javon, Orion, y'all dropping bars. I'm gonna, so I'm, let me recap those right quick. And I know we, uh, I think we have about 15 or 20 minutes left, but I want to make sure that we get um, through a lot of these questions. Thank you for that feedback, y'all. That was great. So to recap, y'all, Shopify, of course, e-commerce platform, great for building out your stores, takes care of a lot of the tools and things that you'll need to build out your site. Um, a CRM software could also be something that you can leverage as well to, to make sure that you're tracking all of your, the individuals on your, um, that are visiting your website and that you wanna interact with and have a customer relationship with. Then of course, Kickstarter, right? You can really leverage Kickstarter to, to, it can almost vet your idea, right? And have like a minimum viable product where you can go, hey, this is the product and idea that we came up with. And you can essentially have the community fund your idea. Um, also, Clavio, anyone that has a store, get on it ASAP, it's worth every dollar because you can literally set up these automations and things. Well, just like Orion said, you can have a abandoned car sequence straight out the box. Facebook Pixel, if you have a website, whatever you have, upload your Facebook Pixel right now. You can have literally six months of user data that you can leverage and create ads with later. And then Google Analytics as well. So make sure y'all take those notes, write those things down as well. And um, I'm going to jump into the next question. And Ryan, I'll start with you as well. Um, what's the biggest challenge in the travel industry at the moment? In my head, I said something and then I remembered it was PG. Traveling? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's traveling. But I mean, it's Everything. the Rona, and it's the people with the Rona. I was on a flight. I, I've been going back and forth to Chicago to handle some family things. And I was on a flight coming back and this guy has his mask on <coughs> and pulls it back up. So he, you, that's the biggest thing. And it, you know, it's affecting everything, right? It's affecting our borders. It's affecting our TSA. It's affecting uh, our ability to come back into the country. A lot of people are like, I ain't scared to leave, but then will I be able to come back? How do I prove it? Are the tests that I'm going to take going to be relevant and, and work with state department's requirements and CDC requirements? What are all these different things? And oh, by the way, I don't want y'all coughing on me. So it really is a challenge um, and, of finding ways to almost get some of those traditional travel experiences, but in a more COVID friendly way, we're seeing more road trips and things like that happening. People exploring what's in their own backyards. And we also got, you know, the fools in Tulum right now. It's about 5,000 people all in the club right now, just all on, they may not get Rona, they may come back with something else, but that's really the big challenge. And when you, when you, when you talk about it, people think of it as it's aspirational now. Like even if you used to travel all the time, if you got your, your 100,000 mile, your, your platinum level, your, your diamond level, you got all of that stuff, you're like, I, I'm not gonna be doing this anytime soon. And so being in the industry and, and talking with people about it, they still have the passion and the love for it, but the planning and the practicality of, I don't wanna put my money on that and not know if there's another wave coming through or another strain or things like that. That's really the challenge that a lot of people are facing. Great point. Great point. Oh, okay, can, oh. I, can I ask, can I ask one question? Yeah, of course. If, 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 if um, while you were putting up with some of the impacts of the, the travel industry, what did you do to pivot? Right. Because you do like collecting checks and I'm thinking you were brilliant enough to come up with something else. So what, what was the other thing that you thought that given what's going on, people would need some product? Was it, you know, a hair care product? Was it a lipstick? You know, what was it? Or if, did you do something like that? I'm assuming you did because we're Duke MBA. That's and, what you know, we do. It's what we do. Like it's how we roll. Um, you know, it's really funny because I've seen some amazing, amazing stories of, of pivoting. So um, bakeries that had to shut down and they're like basically in ruin because they can't bring people in. And they're like, wait a minute, I got a whole bag of flour over here. Let me put this sucker online and tell people to go home and make their own damn bread, excuse me. But they, you know, I mean, it works. Um, for Black Travel Box, it was a unique challenge because I hadn't actually officially launched the brand. So I had started the brand, I had started to do some testing, I had started to talk with people in market, I had a, a, an MVP, as it were, of products, but I hadn't really officially launched it, so awareness was super low. So if I come in and make Black Travel Box your, your favorite, um, you know, conditioner that you have on your sink, I am completely removing all of the brand positioning and the equity and the, the uniqueness in the marketplace, the white space opportunity that is, that 
is enveloping essentially what the brand idea is. And so with that, I had to figure out a way to, to keep it very travel, to keep it very travel and travel focused and far flung places uh, and to keep it black, to be honest, right? Because that's a big piece of it, right? It's this culture and travel. It's a certain type of, you know, it's, it's tapping into the black travel movement. So the way in which we experience the world is very different than other people do. And so with that, I looked at, uh, and to Javon's uh, point, what, do, what am I spending my money on? What am I spending my money on? I'm sitting in the house, smelling everything. So I got candles going in the living room, the dining room, in the kitchen, in the bathroom. And I, you know, I got them all over. I'm like, that's dope. It was, it was something in my product pipeline already. And I basically took the idea of creating a, a sanctuary space in hotels. For those of you who do, did travel a lot, there's nothing worse than getting to the hotel and just being like, this just feels so just aseptic and just kind of, you know, so being able to create your own space and create your own vibe and, and have that Nag Champa and have that, you know, kind of experience going. Uh, I was able to take that and pivot that into at-home candles. And so we launched a staycation collection um, and it's all about, again, that vacation mentality, that travel mentality, it's built into the name. So even if people come to the brand and come to the website via the candles, they know we're not a candle company. They're like, oh, you're all about black travel stuff. Okay, cool, I just happened to find the candles. So, you know, that is that was the way to find a way in and continue to drive relevancy and awareness in a meaningful way without like baiting and switching people. Very smart. And I see that that Harlem speakeasy, that Riviera Bordeaux, the names are great. Those are the names of some of the candles on um, on Orion's on Orion's brand. So great feedback. Um, it's always important, especially nowadays, to find a, a way to pivot within your brand, but still stay relevant and still be able to, to cater to your ideal consumer. So so kudos on that, Ryan. That was great feedback. And and Javon, you know, for you, I would probably ask the same question. What's the biggest challenge in, in the gaming industry or, or even just the media industry as a whole? What are some issues that you faced and, um, you know, how have you overcome them? First of all, uh, Orion, thank you for saying Clavia. I was like, what is it? Clavia. <laughs> so yes, agreed yeah. on Clavio for God's sake. Uh, we, we've actually gotten to a place where uh, our Clavio has gotten uber expensive just based upon the amount of people uh, in our list. And so ROI is even more <laughs> important. I think uh, Orion said a lot about the ROI calculation on uh, um, when you're calculating and you've got your trackable links and you're seeing uh, the transactional revenue and then you kind of go through an internal PL, PL, you have to look at your platform expenses as well in, in order to make sure that that um, ROI calculation. So Clavio is a great tool. It's expensive when you got a bunch of people. It gets a good problem to have, but definitely uh, should definitely be part of your tech stack. I think the biggest thing I, I've, I've, I've seen um, with regards to my industry, I, I used to fly 125,000 miles a year, like I said. And so I used to go to every single gaming convention, right? And our, our business is really driven by, you know, uh, GDC and, 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 and uh, Comic-Con and, you know, uh, VidCon, like all these, like uh, that's my business. And so that just went away. Right. And, and, and even, even more so, uh, I, I used to, I make a bunch of products. I, I ship a lot of products and, and then COVID-19 happened and shipping got really tough. Right. And then on top of that, you couldn't go to the factory and go make the thing. Right. So it was like, usually I would go to China to, I mean, sorry, uh, once a quarter. So three, three to four times a year. Um, and, and, and literally, uh, that stopped right? You, you can't go. And so I ended up, I'm building products on Zoom, right? And, 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 it, the, 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 and you're like in a room and you still got this thing, but you're on Zoom. And, and my day still starting at, at five, six, when, when, when that, when that, when their day start, but my, my day, you know, at, at five, six, six o'clock at night, their day is beginning and I'm building products on Zoom. And so I think what challenged, challenged me is just, the way that we communicated and the idea of business travel just went away and the idea of business conventions went away. And so kind of figuring out how to build a product on Zoom is a lot tougher when you can't put it in your hand and pick it up and look at the paper and you're shipping it back and forth from China via FedEx. And so that was that was a challenge and we got it done. We, we, we literally launched five Kickstarters last year. So we, we were able to get it done, but it was, it, was a, it was a big adjustment. I think the other part is, you know, in a game space, people playing, especially board games, 
playing board games together, you couldn't do that. And so frankly, you know, we had a game that we sold last year uh, uh, called Half Truth. It was between a game, a game uh, with Richard Garfield and Ken Jennings. Uh, Ken Jennings is uh, the Jeopardy greatest of all time. And Richard Garfield created Magic the Gathering as a trivia game. And the way we sold that game was via Zoom. So it became the Zoom trivia game, right? And so we had to really pivot our entire marketing strategy because you couldn't get together with your friends in a room and do trivia, but you can get together with them via Zoom. So I think, yeah, you, like, like Orion said, pivoting the way that we marketed, uh, pivoting the way you did business, pivoting, pivoting the way you distribute. Um, another thing that's blowing up right now is a tabletop simulator, which is like basically you put your game on this online thing on, on Steam for those folks that know Steam is, it's you know an uh, online gaming platform because people can't get in the room to test out games. And so, so this little thing called tabletop simulator exploded because if you're trying to be a game tester and you're trying to test out your game, you want people to try your game, you need this platform. So I think the entire industry has shifted and, and we, you know, and, you know, and we, we had to shift with it in every facet of our business to be, continue to be successful. And just to add something to that, like the innovation that came with the tabletop simulator, it's got so much more legs. So we were talking at the very beginning about like how much of this behavior is going to endure right over time. People are so globalized right now because they're like, I've started making friends with people in other countries because I don't know if they're the person in the house next door to me or if they're a thousand miles away or whatever it might be. And so while you may see that in the testing space and certainly for all of us who are like developing products in whatever space we're in, we're like, yeah, give me the new new so I can make sure that I can do you know this better than the next person. Once that hits consumer, which it will, somebody's gonna be like, let's just sell this. That is going to be insane. And, and we know it's going to be insane because they showed it on Star Trek. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> That's the answer for everything, right? They did, right? They started on Star Wars too, right? Remember that 3D game they used to play on Millennium Falcon? Oh, yeah. Be- oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> the Rock yeah, and wow. guys. Yeah. <laughs> That's great, y'all. Um, I think that's great feedback because right now, the the entire industry shifted, right? Everybody's kind of home. I mean, yeah, things are starting to open up, but it's still kind of crazy. Like I went to, uh, we traveled last week with my family and it was still like the airport. Like it's exactly what you said, Ryan. Getting getting there is fine. Coming back is just, it's a hassle because you got to get the test and this system doesn't integrate with this system, but they can't pre-book you because it's just a lot going on. So, you know, this has forced a lot of people. I mean, the e-commerce industry is booming because everybody's buying online. Everybody's using um, Grubhub and Uber Eats and Amazon. And so all these great products and people are just buying them up because, you know, they're still working and they're working from home, but they can't really move anywhere. So they're buying a lot of products. So this is an opportune time to jump into e-commerce. And, you know, with that said, I want to ask you both a question that, you know, either one of you can jump in and, and do this, but someone that wants to create physical products, what do you think would be like, and I know this involves a lot of steps, but how do you think what would be the best approach for someone that says, hey, you know, I have this idea for this product, or maybe they, they found an existing product overseas that they want to rebrand and update and sell. What do you think would be the best way to go about that? Um, I, I think I think passions first. Like, I, I know that sounds very esoteric, but I think if, if I'm going to leave, leave this call, this, this meeting with something, passion, right? A lot of people drop ship stuff or get into stuff that they think will make a quick buck and then they they're they have you know you get, you see that story they got a garage full of the thing right because you know a lot of people are like oh i want to get in this thing and so i bought a bunch of it and and then you know it doesn't sell and you're stuck with it and so i think i think you know obviously the 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 the, the economics uh, answer of getting a PL and make sure that the pencils and all that stuff right we, we get that right make sure that it's safety and safe tested if, if you're getting from getting it from someplace like Testing is a big part of your PL, right? You, when you get, you know, I, I made a, 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 a child's, a, a toy box uh, targeted towards children, and like I had to test all the goods. That's a part of costing. But I think the most important thing is, is make sure that you're passionate about it. Make sure it's something that, you know, um, because not everything on e commerce sells, right? And so it, it's going to take a lot of work to make it work. And, and, you know, like Orion said, which is the same thing for me, right? I'm in the game because I love games. She, she saw a need in her house and she was like, I, I love this product. So I'm going to sell this product. And I think that's, 
that's the key thing I would say is something that you want to be passionate about because there's a lot of smashing. Everybody was in was was in the uh, the temporary mask game for for a minute, right? It was kind of <laughs> it was kind of crazy, right? Amazon was blocking everybody, right? And there's a <laughs> bunch of people there's a bunch of people that are stuck with masks right now, for God's sake. And so and so be passionate about it. Be be a product that you're gonna um, you know work on. We we actually did a, a, a electronic mask that was we're like okay cool. This guy had a, a great product online that was blowing up. He did this video with his mask that um, it mimicked his mouth. And so we did an LED mask with the with the remote control and all that stuff. So we did it kind of cool and fresh. But there are a lot of people that just, you know, try to smash and grab and, and, and got killed. And so it, it's all about being passionate and, and, and being authentic with what you're putting out. Love that. Love that. OK. OK, great. I, I think that was some great feedback. And, you know, I, I know we want to open it up for questions. I'll ask one more question, then we'll do a quick lightning round, and then um, we'll open it for questions. Is that, is that cool, Boris? Do we still have more time to? Yeah, we got about like nine minutes or so. I think we got okay. a question in the chat, but if you want to go, go ahead, let's go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just finish it up and Dr. then we can Griff, open it up. Dr. Griffin's question. Okay. Got it, got it. It was just a quick question on, um, so user-generated content, which is huge right now. Essentially, people that talk about brands, being able to leverage that, that content and be able to reuse it and repurpose it. No, you don't need like a huge camera and a $30,000, $40,000 production. Now it's really about the user finding a great product and being able to help you sell that. So what are some of your favorite strategies? And I'll start with you, Orion, for um, you know developing user-generated content and getting people to talk about your brand so that you can leverage that content later for ads or, or blogs or content to, um, to get more sales. And I, and I would call them influencers um, for the, you know, the professional ones, Javon, Javon calls them content creators, but I'll, I'll, I'll let Orion go. So I wanted to start some trouble. <laughs> um, I think they both live in the same eco ecosystem and it becomes, you can be an influencer and not be a content creator, but you can't be a content creator, a good content creator and not be an influencer or be influential. That being said, I think it really depends on who your customer and your consumer is, where you start. So I use the example, um, if you are trying to get content from, say you're, you're selling things for, for folks that are like 65 and older, well, their use of technology is gonna be lower. So you need to have a lower barrier to entry for them to even be able to record, or maybe you don't want them to record. Maybe you just wanna call them and get a testimonial and write that on something. That's very different than when you're trying to influence a 22 year old. And so understanding where, where they get their influence from and how they get it is a really big key. I think there was definitely a point for me as a 40 year old, uh, almost 40 year old to see influencers online and be like, man, they got paid for that. I'm not listening. I think I paid for that, right? And so then it became an issue. Uh, it was more like, I need to see a regular person who looks busted and in their house tell me that if I put this cream on, it's gonna do X, Y, and Z and I need pictures. I need photographic evidence. And I'm gonna go back through your timeline and see if you were using it before or if you was already cute. Like that's where I, that I've gotten into an investigative reporter state. So, so there's the understanding exactly when and where and who sort of influences your particular customer and consumer. But then there's also the practicalities of it, right? So how do I get this in in a consistent way? How do I make sure that it's the quality that I'm looking for? How do I do X, Y, and Z? And there is a balance. While you can just do anything, you can't have somebody in a dark room, you can't see, they're muffled on the phone, like, hey, y'all, I just tried this thing. Like, that's not gonna be, that's not gonna be a good piece of content for you. And so it really is then a balance of how do I utilize platforms? There's aggregator platforms where people come on as content creators. And it, it's sort of you know that, that agency system where you can have access to people of a certain quality, depending on what it is that you're trying to do. But then again, you have to lean back into the authenticity piece and start to make sure that you're getting to the right people. There's also things like, I'm, I'm actually looking at a, a platform right now called, what is it, Guru? Oh, I can't think of the name of it. Y'all can put it in the notes when you send it out. But basically it's a new platform. It's linked up to Shopify and it allows you to incentivize your shoppers that have already shopped with you to go back and do a review, to go back and do a video. Now that isn't, it's not just that because normally we have reviews apps and platforms and things that we use and Shopify has those things native. But what it also does is it has a system to track them posting to their social media platforms. So they only get credit when they put it on their platforms. 
So now you have, instead of a thousand passionate customers, you have a thousand passionate influencers because they all know a thousand other people. Wow, bars, bars. <laughs> wow, that's great. I love that. Well, one, yeah, we'll get the name of that, that Shopify app as well so we can share it with, with everybody. That's great. Javon, how about, how about you? Um, you know what? I'm going to open it up for questions. That way we can get these questions answered and get everybody jumped in. If we have time at the end, I'll ask like the lightning round, which is just like favorite books and stuff like that. So Javon, you know, do you think microtransactions can be leveraged outside the video game space? And this, this question is from Jean-Claude. I hope I pronounced it right. Um, Jean-Claude, man, back, that's like 2000. Seven Marvel, two thousand right. old school, old school. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, that's, that's my daughter's home, question. Man. Yeah, how's it going? How's it going? <laughs> How are you doing, man? I'm I'm good, good, good to see you. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I mean, uh, uh, what do you mean so far as uh, kind of the same gamifying microtransactions, the same way you do in games with like just products, like uh, rolling right. out different. Cool. Right, right. So, so you, you know, in the in the, the premium model used in games. You can play the game for free, but if you want to buy boots, you get you got to come up with some cash, right? So, um, it, does that translate uh, to other e-commerce platforms or, or Shopify? Yeah, Shop, Shopify, <laughs> Kickstarter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we, we took the our, our success on on Kickstarter. It's not a video game, but in board games, is pushing people up the um to to purchase more. And so, frankly. Um, you can buy the standard game or you can buy the gold box or you can buy the gold box with the uh, figures or you can buy the gold box with the figures and the mat. And so that's how, we, you know, our average, oh, we did uh, for the last uh, Binding of Isaac Kickstarter, we did uh, $3 million with the, you know, 38,000 back with an average transaction of $69, right? And so kind of getting into that, that those metrics of, of, of being able to uh, offer more goods uh you know and like you said and now kickstarter which is great we're, we're launching kickstarter in a, a month like i said we're having the sequel to binding of isaac coming out and and kickstarter has upsells on the platform and so basically you can add things during the 30-day campaign and upsell so we'll see how that works but we're going to play around with that feature a lot <laughs> and so so the answer to get to, to to cut off fast because I know this is at the end, but the answer is yes. <laughs> oh, great! Thank you. Good to see you. Good to see you. And, and then, uh, Doctor Doctor Griffith had a question as well. Um, basically, uh, you work with startups in the pay payment space in Silicon Valley, and one thing we've noticed is that initial conversations with merchants begin with concerns about the transaction fees, which are mostly standardized. But we quickly see that transaction fees are a red herring. Can you comment on the reflexive? Uh, focus on fees and what feeds into it. Pretty. Uh, margin. Pretty Think like a person that is focused on margin. If you're eating into their margin and they have to go figure out how to balance that out. Do I take my price up? Do I do this? Do I do that? Obviously they take the price up. The fees are going to go up anyway because it's on a percentage basis. Um, but I understand what you mean in terms of a red herring in the sense that for you, it's like, okay, it's pretty standard. Everybody has to pay it. It is what it is, whether it's 1.7, whether it's 2.2, whatever it, you know, 2.1 at this level, yada, yada. For the merchant, it's margin. And what you're telling me is that I'm taking a haircut every time I, I sell. So now I'm stressed out. I, I almost don't want to sell. Like if I sell some, you're going to take some of it. And I think really the positioning has to be one, understanding P&Ls in, in a whole sense, in a holistic sense, and understanding how the different pieces interact with each other. So you may actually have merchants that aren't used to P&L. Maybe they're, they're not used to looking at what I'm getting on the top line and the middle and on the bottom. And so making sure that you're kind of showing them that there is a growth model to it. So we were talking about, Javon was like, Clavio costs you know a grip when you have an email list as big as mine. But when you have an email list as big as his, he can send one email and pay it off for the year. Yeah, because so that's the that's the oh go ahead. Oh no, thanks thanks for that because I think one of the things that's kind of interesting is that when we kind of talk to folks, the folks are like, okay, the two point nine percent, thirty cents is pretty much standard. If you go with Stripe or what have you, and when you suggest to folks, well, have you considered collecting some of these payments using direct debit or ACH, where you pay basically twenty cents a transaction? They've never thought of it in that in that way, right? But yeah, if kind of a, if it's a margin concern, right? Strictly speaking, you pay less in margin if you were to do some of these alternative payment methods, mm -hmm. right? Even something that's kind of like old and boring is ACH, right? So definitely agree with like the cash optimization or kind of like the net cash from payments piece, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's always something deeper, 
And I think you and made a comment earlier about some of the, the other costs that are kind of involved in just kind of you taking payments, right? Like all of the other tools, some of the tools basically are payments related or kind of more visibility related, right? And you get nickel and dime that you kind of never really know that your margin is leaking away through those other tools, not basically kind of like the standardized transaction tools, right? So just kind of, it's, it's helped us kind of better understand basically some of the prospective customers, especially some of the customers that are kind of new to the space, right? Because for them, it's basically, yes, it's like almost kind of a knee jerk reaction like to like taxes, right? Like every, every transaction, basically I have to pay this tax, right? But so much other money is kind of leaking from other tools. So yeah, yeah thanks for that comment. And I think there's a bunch of, sorry, go ahead, please. please. No, 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 please. Just really <laughs> I, I, just, I, get, I get really, I get really emotional about this question because everyone starts with like cost and I'm like, how about if you sell a bunch? <laughs> right. right. And then that's a good problem to have. Right? It doesn't really matter. Right. No, no, Orion, right, exactly. please, what you were going to say, please. Exactly. I think the other thing is, is if it's not simple math, if they don't know, it's, you know, if it's not 50 cents on the dollar, if it's not 20 cents on the dollar, then they're like, I have no idea how much this is going to blow up. So when you start going, well, it's a percentage rate plus this, then they're like, right. uh, and, and the math feels fuzzy. And so ultimately giving solid examples, like what's your average order value? All right. So if, if most of your orders are at this amount, whip out the iPhone, you know, go through the numbers and say, this is what it would look like on average for you. And then you could do comparisons because then they can actually see the differences. The other thing is, is when you tell me, okay, there's ACH and all these other sort of traditional slash non-traditional e -com, but traditional ways to get these dollars. The other thing is understanding on the back end, how do you get things to communicate with each other? How do you move money as quickly as you need it? So like PayPal, PayPal is great until you need that money the next day. Correct. If I was like, uh, I ain't got it unless you got an extra 20 on you. I mean, that's really how it does you. And so a lot of different platforms that enable you to do that, sending an invoice isn't free anymore. You send the invoice, they have to charge it back to you. You have a transaction fee on the cash coming over. Then you have another transaction fee on the cash going back out. And so really demystifying that so that people understand what the full process is, yep. simplifying the math and applying it to um, a model that they know, say their own average order value, so they can kind of get a sense of what the scale is, that would really help a lot to kind of get that um, more solidified in their minds. Oh, thank you, Mia, because we've seen more startups selling education more than payments <laughs> or payments facilitation, <laughs> which is kind of interesting. Well, I, I mean, look, I, I, I have, like, I'm, I'm bursting to talk about this, right? And so, like, like a lot of people go into business and start talking about costs, and that's right. You got to have your PL, and I think everyone there's a bunch of MBAs on this panel. And so, and so everyone's like, you, you know, yeah, you got to have your PL. But what about if you sell a bunch of stuff, right? And so like Kickstarter, <laughs> Ki Kickstarter takes 8%, right? It's 5%, it's 5% for the platform, 3% transaction fee. So everyone's like, oh, Kickstarter takes 8%. I can't, I can't do it. That's too much money. Like blah, 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 blah. Okay. Kickstarter gives your project an average bump of 20%, right? Right. And Kickstarter is 30% of the LTV of your product in, in my space, right? right? So if you look at that in the P&L, right, that yes, you, you pay an 8% transaction fee, but if you get a 20% bump and given the halo effect of a successful Kickstarter campaign where, you know, I've taken games from Kickstarter to Target to global retailers everywhere. And it, so Kickstarter only being 30% of the LTV that 8% starts to look a little bit smaller. And I think a lot of times people focus on, well, the transaction fee, fine. You, there's PayPal transaction fees, Shopify payments, et cetera, et cetera. But what if you sell a bunch of stuff, right? And so think <laughs> about your PL. Like a lot of, like, you know, I, I've got a COO and she's always about cost, cost, cost. I'm like, revenue, revenue, revenue. Just mm -hmm. make sure it goes through the waterfall, take into your OPEX and your platform fees, Clavio, right? And all that stuff. But if you, if the PL, you know, works out and you have a profit margin that's sustainable, pour everything into that channel and, and sell a bunch of stuff. Become a millionaire, go for it. If you got something that works, don't let a, a 5% or a 3% stop you from making the, getting the 20% bump. Mm -hmm. That's that. That's my only, <laughs> I, I, you know, <laughs> I, I've seen a lot of projects die uh, on, hey, I don't want to pay 3%. Yeah, it's like folks are kind of kind of are afraid to be optimistic, right? What if it works? Yes. 
What if it works, right? What, what if it works? Yeah, you can fail, right? I think the, and entrepreneurs are gambling with their life and their finances and their <laughs> well-being, right? Like, I, that's what I'm doing, right? I just started this business. I'm gambling. I'm taking a gamble with me and my wife and my kids. But what if it works, right? Like, The Rock, the Rock's company is called Seven Bucks Entertainment because the guy had $7 in his pocket. Every other entrepreneur has a similar type story right hopefully i'm going to be one of those people right <laughs> but you get you get into this entrepreneurship space because you're betting on yourself and so you don't get to this stage and say well there's a three percent transaction fee i quit like you're gonna have to there's no unless you're going to go out and you're collecting money at a lemonade stand you're going to have to pay some sort of transaction fee clavio costs per people that you have in Clavio, Shopify payments costs, PayPal costs, there's cost, 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 cost. But you got to know your P&L, you got to know your numbers, and you got to know your net profit margin. If that, if that P&L is out, then go for it. You know, you, you, you're, I think, assume people are here because they want to take their shot. And so I'm not saying don't do your numbers. As a matter of fact, this whole thing's about passion, but balancing it off with numbers and tech stack. So be very meticulous about it, but take your shot. If it pencils out, go for it, you know? Great, that's great advice. Oh, that's, that's, that's awesome. So I, I know we're past, we're past 8 p.m. So I do want to thank Javon, Orion. I want to thank you, Boris, for, for putting this whole thing together. And uh, thank you all for coming through. It's, it's super appreciated. And I'm, I'm so glad that we got this chance to sit down to talk. It's Friday night, you know, everybody could have been out. Well, I mean, I don't know about out, but you know, you could at least like order in food or watch something on Netflix, but you chose to be here with us. So thank you uh, all so much. And, and, you know, special thank you to Javon and Orion for you jumping on, especially you, Orion. I know you're about to jump on a flight in a few. So that's what we got, y'all. That's what we got, Boris. I'll let you take it over and I'll, uh, I'll sit back here and just soak it all in. All right, John. So uh, grading you, excellent work. I know I know. Evan was trying to give you props, but Evan's like your business partner and good friend, so I couldn't have him with his bias <laughs> here. That's so, the homie. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you emailed me. You were like, boys, I've never moderated before. <laughs> Evan put you on the spot. Listen, um, man, I'm listening to podcasts. I'm watching, I'm reading blogs late at night. I'm like, I gotta, okay, let me let me try and do a good job with this. You know, I took a shot of, took a shot of whiskey, some Japanese whiskey right before this. So I feel- That's even, the secret. Feel, that's the secret. <laughs> no, that's the secret. <laughs> and, 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 and the other thing is, listen, we're, we're um, you know, we're doing our Black Men Talk Tech Conference a little later this year. We're also planning on uh, joining forces and more closely with our Black Women Talk Tech Conference. So you're about to see some changes come up. One of the things that we want to do is to have smaller, intimate um, pieces like this leading up to our conference. And, and hopefully we could figure out a, a panel to invite Orion and Javon back on. I know you're both like growing your business and Javon, you have a business that actually serves a lot of entrepreneurs. So if we could spotlight the light on that, uh, you know, to help direct uh, more revenue to you, you know, we'd love to do that. And clearly, um, we, since last year, we've been focusing on speaking to small business owners who are not tech oriented and tell them, hey, get comfortable becoming tech oriented. And if you need to, you know, chat with, you know, marketing maestros, uh, you know, we, we have brilliant people who you should, you know, talk to. See what you did there. That was awesome. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, hey, hey, any last words before we hop off? Or Ryan, you got to catch a flight. Javon, you, it's probably early there in LA. Uh, John, any questions you wanna you wanna ask before we we hop off? Oh yes. Last question is to both of you. Where can everybody find you both? Uh, catch me out. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> you can find Black Travel Box at Black Travel Box, all one word on pretty much any social platform, but our primary bread and butter is over on IG. Um, you can find me, Orion underscore Helana, H-E-L-A-N-A. -A. Boris can throw it in the, in the chat there um, on, on social as well. You can find Black Travel Box at theblacktravelbox.com as well. Um, and yeah, keep a lookout. Javon, I'm going to hit you up because I'm actually going to do my first crowdfunding campaign here in a few weeks. So I love it. I love and it. Boris I'm, is going to share it with this group because, you know, he's my homie. He's going to support. <laughs> That's right. That's right. LinkedIn's are here once more. Um, uh, Javon, any final words? Uh, yeah, maestromedia.com. We, we have our big uh, Kickstarter uh, launching. Um, you guys can check that out uh, at thefoursouls.com. It's the sequel to our Binding of Isaac Kickstarter, um, which I said we did 
um, $2.7 million and, you know, got a big uh, hit after that. And this is the sequel to it. So you'll, all the stuff I've talked about, about taking your shot and you guys will get to see it real time. And so you can come back to me in a month and say, you know, <laughs> you know, if it all worked out, but uh, yeah, this has been fantastic. Super excited to, to, to talk to everyone. Good to see Josh Hart. My God, you, uh, you helped me through business school. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. That, like that, this has been amazing seeing the names on here. And so um, thank you for being here, Boris. Thank you for, for having me. Um, it's so great to be a part of this amazing organization and, and hopefully I can help in more ways. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Um, stay tuned for updates from what we're going to be, not stay tuned, but just like follow us on LinkedIn. You'll see updates on what we're going to be working on for next month. Uh, and John, now we got to get you back. I don't know if we need to work out a budget for you, but it's it's going to happen. You, you got to come back. <laughs> you were amazing, John. You were amazing, man. Job. Oh, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. I, I researched both of you. You both are powerhouses in your own, uh, in your own um, respect. So thank you again for the opportunity. And uh, if you want to catch me, it's John D. Saunders pretty much on everything. So you can find me on Instagram most likely. And uh, yeah, thank you all for coming. Black Illustrations. Talk to you guys later. Oh, there you go. All right, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night. Enjoy your weekend.